Hey you, my name is Jer. I can't shut up about mobile photography and today I can't shut up about the Shift Cam Lens Ultra 60 millimeter telephoto lens. This is something I bought with my own money. There's lots of reviews out there from people who were given it or even paid to do a review. I bought this because I was excited about it. I have a lot to say. This is a long review. I'm gonna try to keep it concise, but basically, uh, we're gonna go into it. What does it do? How does it work? And do I recommend it? And spoiler alert, <laughs> I don't recommend it. So if you're looking for a review that gives you permission to buy this, you can go ahead and buy it if you want. But you're gonna see in this video my reasons why I think it is something to pass on both as a product and as a company. So this lens is part of a set. There's uh, wide angle ones, anamorphic ones, macro ones. I was interested in them all, but this was the one I thought was the most important and I wanted to invest in the system as a whole. So I bought this first and uh, learned what I could from it. That's what we'll be looking at in this review. Also, this review is only about how this lens interacts with the iPhone 15 Pro. That's what I have. I don't have the Pro Max, although I'll talk a little bit about how it would work differently. I'll also talk at the end about how I think it might interact with other phones, older iPhones in particular. For now, all the examples are iPhone 15 Pro. And another spoiler alert, there seems to be a problem with the iPhone 15 Pro where it doesn't work as well. So a lot of those problems may or may not be specific, but I'll show them and make that clear as we go. Why did I buy this lens? What does it claim to be able to do that made me wanna buy it? Well, for one thing, to see further. Of course, it's a zoom lens, so hopefully it's gonna help you see further. The reality of the iPhone 15 Pro is it can see pretty far, and this actually doesn't let me see that much further on the normal lens, but on the 3X lens, it does let me see twice as far, at least on the iPhone 15 Pro. We'll talk more about that. Another thing I was hoping for from this lens was more resolution. Because of the way the iPhone works as you zoom in on the normal internal iPhone lenses, you get less and less resolution. So putting this in front should give you more resolution and we'll look at how that actually pans out in real life. Another thing I was hoping for from this lens is more bokeh, which means background blur because it's more zoomed in. The background should be more blurry and beautiful like you would have on a big camera. We'll check out that effect and see whether it's worth it. The last thing I was hoping for was a unique look. And that's kind of abstract and very subjective, but the idea is mobile phones tend to have a kind of look to them. And if you add a lens in front, maybe, just maybe it'll change things in a way that makes it look like a film camera or a DSLR, something to just take away that precise look of a phone camera. Um, and this lens in fact does do that and I uh, may, may do it a little bit too much. So we'll look at examples later and you can be the judge. Finally, the last th reason I bought it is simply because I want to commit to mobile photography. I love that my phone is so capable and so small and easy to carry and I always have it with me and I want to extend that any way I can. You know, I have a lot of experience being a photographer. I have a great camera kit. I have the Fuji X-T10 here. That's an older camera, but the lenses are excellent and it still takes really amazing pictures. I have some F1.4 primes, um, but carrying them around is a pain. Not only is I, the camera heavy, the lens is heavy, but I need to carry three different lenses to get anywhere near the range and options that I get from my iPhone. And on the latest iPhones, the iPhone 14 and 15 with the 48 megapixel sensor, the quality is so good. It's good enough. All I want is more options and control. If I could just attach this lens to the phone, I would, and, and hopefully it would give me a little more background blur on all those things that I'm hoping for from, from this shift cam lens. Finally, the last thing is very superficial, but it is part of photography, which is being taken seriously. You know, when I show up at an event and I hold my mirrorless and I say, hi, I'm the photographer. Can I take your picture for the organizers of this event? People take me seriously and they, they love this camera too. They smile. I get really great photos as a result of it. And I thought maybe, you know, if I show up at an event and I've got this and I say, hey, cheese, you know, maybe they'll say cheese a little more. And in that logic, I actually told myself, you know, I saw some reviews that said the quality might be so great. And I said to myself, well, if it's as good, if it's just 
as good as the default lens and doesn't ruin the photos, then the fact that it looks cool will actually be worthwhile and times when I really want that sort of effect of seeming professional and I, I have a grip and everything, um, it'll be worth carrying and putting it on. But the question is, is it good enough? Does it ruin photos or not? And that's what this review is gonna be all about. Before we dig into explaining how the lens works and then analyzing some examples of photos, I wanna give a quick TLDR of why I don't recommend it and why I don't think it's for anyone. So the highlights include the images are blurry. There's just a loss of detail in most of the image in almost every photo I took with it. You lose access to portrait mode, so you can never make the background artificially blurry afterwards, which is an extremely useful feature of the iPhone 15 Pro. On top of those things, which are really the deal breakers for me, there's also the overall hassle. Every time you use it, you have to put the case on, you have to bring the lens, you have to attach it, you can't use your phone normally, you can't use the other lenses while it's attached because it blocks them, and there's a whole thing with, you have to do the macro, I'm gonna show you, but all that hassle, you know, theoretically I'd be willing to put up with all those things if it didn't ruin the images by making them all smeared and blurry, uh, but all of it together is too much. Now, there is something nice about the images and there is a look that's not, doesn't look like smartphone photos when you use this because of the way the blur and the smearing works. And I'm gonna talk about that and you can decide for yourself if you think it's a valuable investment nonetheless. Now, finally, I wanna say this, we're gonna go into way more detail about all this stuff, but this one especially, this company is a nightmare. Shiftcam, the company, if you order from their website, if you look at their marketing materials, we're gonna dig into it at the end, all that drama. Um, so if you want, please stay till the end if that's what you're interested in or zoom forward. But boy, oh boy, I am not excited to support this company and I knew it when I bought it and, and I don't regret it because I, it's given me content to make this video. All right, let's see how this thing actually works and the little nu nuisances that are involved in using it. So we have our lens here and we're gonna check it out. So first, just for the sake of all the rest of the video, I wanna just make sure everyone understands what I'm talking about when I talk about one, which is labeled as 1X or 24 millimeters, 1.5, which is a zoom of the one lens that gives you uh, as much as 24 megapixels of resolution, the two, which is where you zoom in again on the main lens, which is this one, the one we're gonna put the lens on, um, and then the three, which actually you could see it changes the lens, it changes the perspective and there's a little blur because it's switching to this lens at the bottom, okay? And it's gonna work on the iPhone 15 Pro and on the 14 Pros, you can attach it to that bottom third lens, as you can see, um, and it, it sort of works and we'll talk about how, what I mean by sort of. Uh, on the iPhone 15 Pro Max, you don't have a 3X lens there, you have a 5X lens. It doesn't work, that just doesn't work at all. So if you've got the iPhone 15 Pro Max with the 5X Tetra Prism, uh, this won't do nothing for you, but lucky you, you have the 5X and it's, I, tr I assure you, better than using this on the 3X and it's better than the 3X in general because this, the thing about this is the one, the 1 1.5 and the two, are excellent. They're all such good lenses. And part of what I was excited about with this Lens Ultra was not only will it let me put it on the one and have a 2X, it'll let me put it on the 1.5 and have a three and on the two and have a four. And that even when I have the lens screwed on, I'll still have a lot of options because I'll be able to do this. And it's true, I do. Um, but big annoyance is that every single time you put it on, it is going to engage the macro mode. And you could see here, if we just hold something up, you know, every time you get close to something, you've been through this on your iPhone, if you have a recent one, where it shifts in and out, and sometimes it's it's shifting, and depending on the angle, it's, it's, it's not reliable. Um, and what you have to do, if you know, is see the little flower icon, and you push it. If you push it, it says, no, never engage the macro mode automatically. Always keep the lens I'm telling you, whether it's two, three, or 0.5, right? And the way the macro works, of course, is that it uses the 0.5, which is able to focus as close as you want, but it says, oh, you're on two, but you're really close. If the macro, so I turned on the macro, I, I 
undisabled it. And so now it says, okay, you want two, but I'm gonna crop the 0.5 mode so that it looks like two, but you're gonna have a hell of a lot of less resolution on it. Okay, and so the thing is, and I will stop now and put on the lens, which is not too hard. It's not a big problem. All right, so now I'll go back to one. So this is the lens. How does it look? I guess this is the first time you're seeing what it actually does. Oh, wait, oh no, how am I supposed to demo it? Of course. What it's doing is switching to the 0.5 because it perceives something close to the lens and the 0.5 is actually able to focus on this. Like you can see the lens, isn't that nice? No, it's not nice. Uh, what we need to do is get the flower and then disable it. And the thing is sometimes it doesn't work. See, the macro mode is still engaged, but it's gonna be unreliable right now. And if I move around, it's gonna do it. So here's the solution. If you have this lens and you just wanna use it, here's my advice. Put your hand completely in front of the lens so that no matter what, if I try to disengage it. Okay, so if it's like this, if it's working, you put your hand in front of the lens, that's gonna guarantee that macro mode comes on. Then you can see the flower, then you touch it in the corner to disable it. Now you're gonna get what you asked for. So you're only gonna see the 0.5 if you click 0.5. If you click the one, you're gonna see one, the 1.5 and the two. Of course, if you go to three, uh, oh yeah, it does something weird where actually what you should see when you go to three is the the third lens, which is blocked, right? Because it blocks everything. You can see it, it blocks everything. This is why you can't use portrait mode when you are uh, have the lens on because the lasers that it uses for portrait mode and it uses both lasers and um, and multiple lenses to, to give the portrait effect, but they're all blocked. It's all blocked. So all you could see is through one lens at a time, and by default, it's gonna wanna show you this. So there you go. That's the annoying thing. You're always gonna have to pay attention and turn off that macro thing. In my experience, it'll last a little while, uh, but it's gonna come back up, and it's gonna come up when you're not expecting it, when you've had the phone away for a while, and then every time you put the lens on, you're gonna have to remember, uh-oh, I need to disable that macro, put your hand and do it. Is it the end of the world? No, you, I could survive with it. But am I gonna miss shots if I'm walking around with this lens on? Yes, I'm gonna miss shots because I'm gonna be in the middle of framing it and then it's gonna kick out and then I'm gonna have to push the button and get my hand in front of it and try and use, you know, to, you, you know using this with one hand is really hard because it's heavy. And so I'm gonna end up with problems. So uh, a final thought is about the 3X lens. So now I'm gonna show you the 3X lens. So we're gonna go to 3X, right? Which is not the best lens, it's the worst by far. You screw, I'm gonna screw it on. And this is the iPhone 15 Pro, not the Max. The Max has the 5X and this doesn't work at all. But okay, so here's what we get. Not great. So if I turn off the macro disablement, which I already had on from a previous use of the lens, uh, what we get is this. It is, of course, the 0.5, right? Kind of cool to look at, but not very useful. Uh, it's doing this because it thinks we want macro. So if I come and turn off the macro by covering it with my hand, we're gonna go to the three, okay. Now, see, so the three, it's going a cropped version of the 0.5. I can turn off the flower, which turns off macro mode. And that means we're seeing through the 3X, but it just doesn't work. It's not reliable. And, and sometimes, so just trying to help you understand, sometimes it might actually work and I, I just can't get it. Like sometimes, there we go. I focused on the corner and for some reason that fixed it. And now it can see, but look, I don't know, you know, can we blame shift cam for this horrible rendering? I don't know. You know, it's just the way the camera works. It's the way all the lenses and the switching works together, which is out of their control. But for what it's worth, in the main camera, you're not gonna get a good result. Now, if I come and instead go to Halide, a four pay app, which you have to go like this. Okay, so Halide, one of the things that's nice about it is there's no lens switching unless you do it manually. So right now it's on one X in the top right corner. If I click, it'll go to 2X, and if I click, it'll go to 3X. Okay, and so with the Halide app active, you actually can, um, see a little bird, uh, 
you can use it. So I can use this and I can take a picture. Um, I haven't tried, there's, Halide doesn't take video, but I imagine you could use the black camera video app uh, to manually set the lens and then and have it work. But um, yeah, what a pain in the butt <laughs> that, that it doesn't work in the default camera. I, it's just too much for it to process somehow. Um, and even when you do get it to work, like you saw, uh, you get that nightmare of a uh, like weird lighting rendering. So I see here, I can't, I can't manage to get it to, there we go. Um, it doesn't look right. I would say it doesn't look right and then that happens and your life is not very fun when it's like that. Okay, I'm clicking in the top right, that's the secret. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, uh, I do not recommend buying this for the 3X because of these pain points. If you're already using something like Halide, then you may find it reasonable um, to use uh, on occasion, but uh, also you'll see in the test the quality is bad. So anyway, I just wanna show how this works. There we go. Now that you've seen how the lens works and have a sense of what it's like to use it, let's take a look at the different images that can be produced with and without the lens. So in this graphic, I've tried to cram as much information as I could into it. More or less, the top row, that's what you can get by zooming in your, cam your phone without the lens on. You've got the one times, which can do 48 megapixels. You've got the 1.5 times, which is also called 35 millimeter. Uh, that's when you click on the one icon again. I didn't include the one which is 28 millimeters uh, because it's just a lot of extra images and it didn't actually coincide with any of the zoom levels. Um, but at that level, the 1.5, you can get up to 24 megapixels. So it's still a really good resolution, twice as much as the 12 megapixels that you get when you go to two times. And then also you have 12 megapixels when you go to three times. And of course, the three times being the other lens, which isn't as good. In my experience, when you're using the um, main lenses without any attachments on the iPhone 15 Pro, the 3X, it looks fine here, but in practice, it's got more noise. It's just got a worse look. And I always prefer to use the 2X whenever I can because they both have 12 megapixels and the 2X is gonna have a more out of focus background and overall just more fidelity and quality and it looks more like a big camera. Okay, so what do you get when you put the lens on? You get the bottom row. Now, the first thing to notice and, and what I talked about earlier is for each level of zoom, right? That first one with the one times in the 60, you get a level of zoom comparable to either the 1.5 or the two. And it's actually 1.75, it turns out. So each of these, you have something in the middle. So in between the 1.5 and the two normal one, you have the one plus the 60 millimeter, right? So that's a 1.75. And then in between the two and the three, you get the 1.5 with the 60 millimeter lens on top. So on, in this range, what it basically gives you is different levels of zoom, but with more resolution, right? And that was something I was really looking forward to because if I'm taking portraits of people, I thought I'll just put the lens on, I'll have more megapixels uh, with a similar field of view. Um, you can also a little bit see how the background is blurry if you compare uh, the... Uh, 2x without the lens and the 1.5x with the lens, you'll see that the images are pretty similar in terms of how zoomed in I am, but the background is much more out of blur, uh, out of focus. And we'll take a look at that a little more later. Okay, and then finally you get the uh, 2x with the 60 millimeter lens, the second last one, and it is more zoomed in than you get with the 3x, uh, but with the original lens, you so see you get all those benefits. And then finally, uh, the 3X lens with the 60 millimeter lens on top, which only works on the iPhone 15 Pro and not the 15 Pro Max as discussed. Um, it gives you a very zoomed in look. So there you go. This is the overall view. Uh, hopefully this helps you understand why the megapixel thing is appealing in at least in theory. With this, I think it makes sense to move on to some example images uh, that I did. And, and the way I did this set and the next set was to put the phone on a tripod and 
just zoom in. So it's the exact same image in all cases, except I'm zooming in with the camera without moving the tripod at all. Um, and so here's another one. This is a test I devised using the background in my office here. Uh, and the goal was to get as much detail all over the image so that we can see if there's detail failing. And the fact is that's exactly what I find. But with the one times lens, and you can see here, if you we zoom in, in the center of the shot, I've got these stickies that say no lens, one X. So as I'm scrolling around, if, if you're looking at it on a, a format, uh, where you can manage to see those, then that'll be useful to know which one is happening at any given moment. Um, so overall, I would say that the 1X lens, especially the main lens on the iPhone is extremely sharp. It's sharp from corner to corner at any given time. You can zoom in to just about anything and see nice detail. It's not going to be blurry even on the corners. Um, and this is very much unlike when you have the lens attached. So if we come over, so this is the one, this is the 1 1.5, still very, very sharp. We can go up to the corner and this little thing that says gracias, right? Up to the resolution of the sensor, which in this case is 24 megapixels, it still looks great. Okay, now we'll come to the first one. So these are in order of zooming in. So it goes back and forth between with and without the shift cam lens. So here's the first one with a shift cam lens on it. What we could see here is that it still looks pretty good. And I'll say this now, if you're looking at this on your phone, I, I don't know, I don't think you're even gonna see a difference because even though what I'm talking about, I consider a devastating lack of detail that makes me not wanna ever use the lens. When you look at it on a phone, you just it's just not big enough. You'd have to zoom in. I have to if when I try to compare them on my phone, I have to zoom way in and then I have to zoom out and switch images and zoom in again. It's really hard to see. That's why I have it up on my 5K screen going back and forth and like, you know, in photography we call it pixel peeping. The act of looking more closely at an image than almost any usual viewer would. Now, my defense of this is if you don't pixel peep this lens doesn't make a difference. It's very subtle what it does in terms of the resolution bonuses, in terms of the background blur, for sure it's subtle. Um, and that means that the only way to appreciate it is to look at it like this. And honestly, that's a reason not to use the lens. Like it's such a hassle to do all the stuff to use it. So is it worth it if you can't even see it on your phone? Like if I, if you look at a picture from my mirrorless camera on your phone, you're gonna see that it's different. You're gonna see the difference. So why would I bother paying for this lens and then carrying it around and strapping it on and getting all the downsides that I described earlier if it's not even perceivable? So I'm trying to find what's perceivable as differences and then say, is it good or is it bad? And in this case, it's bad. Okay, so my things I like to look at here are the corner, uh, it's just ruined. Look at this, the way this light bulb looks. Look at the way all this art is looking. This word test, like it's not out of focus. It's in focus, but it's in the wrong part of the lens. And the, the trend that I noticed is there's a portion in the center of the lens that is in focus. And what I mean is the detail isn't ruined. So if we zoom in on this, uh, what is this, a hedgehog? Um, you could see there's actually quite a bit of nice detail. It's pretty sharp. But if we move just a little bit up to these birds, like they're so blurry and weird. And look at this 60 millimeter, look at the way it's just rendered. It's, it's just smeared. But you know, part of this sign isn't quite so bad, although it's pretty bad. Okay, and like, look at this 500 bill. Okay, right? There's just no detail. We can barely read this text. And if we come in and go to the next one where we don't have the lens on, look how much clearer it is. We could just really see a lot, even though we can't zoom in as far, because at this point we have a 2X image and this is only 12 megapixels. So I can only zoom in so far on this sign for Hidalgo, okay? But we could see the text pretty clearly and look at this bill. Whereas if we go over this, now we're back on the one with the lens, Look at the bill, look how blurry all of this is. And it's not out of focus. 
It's just that only a small amount of the image, see this text, this tiny text here, this is perfectly in focus. So the theme is every image you take, you're gonna have a big chunk of it that just loses a bunch of detail. And my conclusion here, if we look, here's one with the lens. My conclusion is looking at this, like the way, the way it just blurs out is that there's no benefit for sure to the extra resolution because having a 48 megapixel image where it's 48 megapixels of blurry stuff that's nothing, it's worthless. You might as well have a 12, 12 megapixel file with more detail. Like, I don't know, okay, even like these two, this, now we're at the 77 millimeter. So now we're at the 3X lens, but look at the difference in detail between the 500 here, just look at it. And the 500, when we zoom in, this is the worst lens, but the, the lens ultra, destroys so much detail that to me, it's just not worth it. Um, so let's keep going, right? And then this is the, uh, this is at 2X with the lens. And the thing about this 2X and the 1.5 is the 1X, as soon as you put the shift cam lens on top of your phone's lens, it immediately, all the corners get soft, right? And you can see here, if I I'll close this and zoom in like, just look at the smearing nonsense here um, versus in the center. Like, look, you could see the detail, but if you go to the corner, like all the corners are ruined and that's normal. All these lenses sort of do that. And you know, you probably don't have the most important stuff in the corner, but in this case, right above the center, this bird is already blurry. And then when you go to 1.5 X and you go to 2 X, all you're doing is zooming in really, right? That's all those do, but in this case, with the normal lens, where you start with the default 1.1 1 .1 and 1 point, and then go to 1.5 and 2, you're zooming in on an incredibly sharp image where the glass is perfectly tuned to the sensor and it gets extreme amounts of detail considering it's just a phone. When you put the lens, the shift cam lens on top, immediately it just it smushes all the detail so that when you zoom in, it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. So personally, if I do, if you do have this lens and you're looking for advice, my advice, what I follow is I'm probably never gonna do anything other than 1.0 plus the lens and then just get closer to people. All right, so my suggestion is stick with the 1.0 Enjoy all the detail that you can get from that. Uh, unless potentially something really is far away, in which case the 3X actually is competitive. Even though the 3X here, this image is the least detailed, my least favorite, especially on portraits. I find it makes people look crunchy and weird. Um, the 3X with the lens on top is the cleanest and the highest quality out of all of the ones with the lens, because the, I don't know, I don't understand exactly why, but across all these images, and we'll look at some more examples in detail, it seems like the, something about the 60 millimeter on top of the 1X lens, the main camera on the 15 Pro, iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max in particular, it's just wrong, something went wrong. It was supposed to be the same camera as in the iPhone 14, but the reviews of the iPhone 14 had such sharper images that I think it must somehow be that the the, the coding, they changed the coding, I don't know. Either way, I, I, it makes the lens unbuyable to me, but actually the one place I might consider using it is with the 3X. So this is the 3X with the lens. And it's not perfect. Um, there is like some distortion happening up here. There's some colors and we'll see a lot of that, like this color distortion. Cause it just kind of like, it's like it shifts a little bit. So you get this like blue on the bottom and you get orange on the top. But to me, it's still a usable image. And if we look in the corners, um, there is some color distortion, but actually this is workable and this is usable and the text works compared to the other one. The corners are actually useful and so is basically the whole image. And so if something genuinely is far away and, and you have the 3X to use because you have either an iPhone 14 or an iPhone 15 Pro, but not Pro Max, go ahead and, and strap it on there, get your uh, third party application and take a picture because it's not the end of the world, just unlike what happens when you put it on the One X. All right, 
So, oh my God, thank you for listening to all that. I wanted to jump into a few specific examples. So we've been zooming in and out, maybe it's been messy. So if you need to, you can pause and just gaze upon these tests. So this is the zoomed out version that we already had with the, we're comparing here the 2X. So we've, we're on the main lens, but we've zoomed in all the way. We only have 12 megapixels on the left from the main, the default iPhone camera. And then on the right, we've got the 1X, so we have, 24 or 48 megapixels, but we've got the problem. So zooming in, I just wanted, I thought this was a good way to visualize. Look at the differences in that drawing at the top. There's, it's night and day, right? Would you ever want to print an image and have that kind of detail when you could have the one on the left? To me, it's no contest. It doesn't matter how many pixels there are. All right, so up next, was something really similar. I just wanted to try low light. So this one I shot during the day, the, the window was open and the light was coming in and the ISO is very low. I think it was around like 80. These ones, it's more like 800, 1000, or sorry, these ones, it's more like 800 to 1000. So basically we see the same thing, except interestingly, the thing about the lens is, it depends which way you use it, because if you hold the lens like this, the part that's blurry is different than if you hold it like this, all right? And I don't know, do you want to live your life trying to memorize which way to use it depending on which part of the frame your subject is in? Because honestly, that's what I'm led towards. If I would was going to try to use this lens, I'd be like, well, if my subject is slightly left and down, I'll, I'll do it this way. And if my subject is, you know, I don't know, because here's the thing, uh, in this other one, in the first one, the hedgehog is sharp, but the monkey is blurry. Uh, and the name of the person in the, in the bottom of, of the art here, uh, where it says C Chavez, that is sharp. But if we go to this one, and zoom in, so I'll go to my comparison at the end. The C Chavez is not sharp. So you could see how it inverted. And even on this one, you could see that the monkey is nice and sharp and it's the hedgehog that is blurry. So anyway, I think, I thought that sort of helps you understand the differences. Um, otherwise, it was exactly the same pattern. As with the other example where I did a portrait set in low light, what I find is it it is a little more equal because the low light means that the 2x, like when you're zooming in on the main lens, you have less detail, like it's a high ISO and you lose some detail. And so they're closer together, the outright destruction of detail that we see in uh, the with the shift cam is less worse because the main image is already worse, but the same thing happens. And to me, this is still a disaster. All right, so uh, I'll try not to spend too much time. This is a picture of the building across the street from me. I took it with and without. So here's uh, with, uh, without, here's one with, here's one without, here's one with the lens, here's one without, with, and then with the three X, okay. So what do we find here? If we, we look from this level, maybe they look the same to you. Let's zoom in. I have a couple zooms here. So this first one, just you could see the, I don't know, can you see the letters and how much blurrier they are, how much worse they are? Looking at the windows, we could see just a totally different kind of detail and it just looks out of focus, but it's not. It's a giant building. It should all be in focus. Uh, here we have another part of the same image uh, where I wanted to show how the background rendered, like the ba the building looks blurry and maybe there's a little bit of it being background blur, but really that's just the corner of the lens being having no detail at all. I don't know if you could see, but the bricks, there's so much more detail in the bricks on the left. Um, once again, this is no contest. If what you're doing is trying to get detail, you are better off not using this lens, at least with the iPhone 15 Pro. But here, like I was saying, the 3X isn't so bad. And like on this one, when we're zoomed out, this is the zoomed out version. And here I, I, I didn't match them. So it shows you how much more zoomed in you can get, which it actually is not that much in a way, you know? Um, 
and there is less detail on the shift cam one, but it's more comparable. And if we do the zoom in thing, and I zoomed in really far here to the point where the one on the left, like, I don't know about you, but I can really see the pixels on this um, satellite dish, for example. Like I zoomed in beyond the resolution of the image, be which shows you if, you're, if you have a nice big screen, you'll see that on the right, we still have resolution. Like this is a big file. And it has stuff to show us, but it's all blurry. The satellite dish is here, but it's so smoothed out that it doesn't really give us anything compared to the pixelated version. But uh, anyway, you be the judge. I wanted to include that so you could take a look. All right, so here we have the same images of me that were in the reference earlier, but now we're looking at them a little bigger. Um, here's a, an image that I think tells a lot of stories. So here we're comparing the 2x to 1x with the shift cam. So again, the one on the left would be a maximum of 12 megapixels. The one on the right, a maximum of 48 megapixels. The things to notice in the top right of each image, in the background, you can see the difference in background blur. And it's one of the things shift cam promotes about this lens. And it's a natural element of optics and physics, which is the closer the lens is to the thing, the more out of focus the background will be. And so because the shift cam is looking closer at me effectively, the background is more blurry. But how much more blurry, right? Is this actually, a, is this gonna affect your images to have that small amount of extra blur? It's, I think it's like about one stop or something along those lines. Also, it's kind of ugly. Uh, personally, I don't think it's a very beautiful blur. If you look at it in detail, maybe I can zoom in. Um, there's kind of like a color distortion haze, like a chromatic aberration, or I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's not really that beautiful compared to the nice clean picture we have over here. Um, and by zooming in, we can also see the difference in noise. There's more noise on the left. This is this, the 2X is using the center of the sensor as it always is, a cropped version of the 1X. And so it's gonna have more noise. But honestly, when, when you come back and look at the, um, the actual photo here, the noise in this image is only gonna matter when you're looking at it on a 5K display and then zooming in. Um, in real life, that's not gonna matter. What's gonna matter more is the, the way in which it's blurry, right? So just looking at these images, I don't know if you could see it at this scale, but uh, the, it, the background does look blurrier even at this scale to, to my eyes. So coming back here, I wanted to show that. That's the difference. It's subtle. It's not gonna make a difference to your images compared to like, let's say I was smiling and I had a charming smile. That would affect this image a lot more. I was trying to keep a straight face so that they'd all be the same and I wouldn't bias myself. Um, but okay, what else do we see in this image? We definitely can see the lack of sharpness. My left eye is in the sweet zone, right? It's in the hedgehog zone of this image or whatever. Um, my right eye, completely blurry. We could see it unambiguously. The left eye is sharp, the right eye is not sharp. Um, if I was using my big camera, this happens sometimes when I'm using on f1.4, super shallow depth of field where one eye is sharper than the other but there's no reason it should happen here. Neither of these lenses should be giving enough background blur that one of my eyes blurry. It's the lack of detail. You could see my whole face on the right is blurry, whereas it's sharp all across on the other one. It's just an example of that lack of detail. The thing to say is, in a portrait, is it the end of the world? No, and in fact, I kinda like them. I kinda like that you can't see my skin so much because the one on the left makes me feel self-conscious, but, the thing is, there was a lot of pictures I took where I thought it was out of focus and it wasn't. It was that both my eyes were in the dead zone with no detail. So do you wanna take that risk when you're taking pictures that you look at it later and say, oh crap, it, it's all blurry? Anyway, I think the answer is obvious. You don't want that. You'd want the sharp one. You can always go in in your editing software and add a lack of detail. You could do noise reduction, you could do smoothing. There's all kinds of things you could do later starting with detail and then removing it. If you don't have detail to begin with, all you have is sharpening and sharpening ruins photos. I'll leave that at that. Okay, next I wanted to give an example of what other options you have if you leave the lens off the camera, specifically portrait mode. The lens disables portrait mode. There's no way to get it back. 
On the iPhone 15 Pro, you can take any image that you have, or any iPhone 15, you can take any, any image with a person in it and add the portrait mode later. You don't even have to think about it. On the older cameras, it is annoying because you have to decide to use it uh, before you take the photo, but with the new one, it's so convenient, it's so awesome. So here's an example. I took an image that didn't have portrait mode and I just added some. Because it didn't have the lens on, I had the option, and I just added the tiniest little bit. And that's the thing to remember is, the shift cam only adds the tiniest little bit of blur and it's ugly blur. So if that's all I need, right? I can go in portrait mode and just set it to F16 where it looked about the same. I put it one more, F14, the edgy edgy edge of, of the setting there for changing the portrait mode. And already it looks more blurry. And to my eyes, it's a more smooth and beautiful blur. You call, you know, the quality of the bokeh is better. It's more what I want. It's more like my big camera. So I don't mind at all. Plus, the problem with portrait mode, as those of you who know who use it know, is it ruins the detail around the edge of the subject, right? It, it collapses that you end up with this blurry line. It makes little mistakes in certain places. Well, for one thing, if you've got an iPhone 15 Pro or 15, it's so much better than it used to be. It really is clean and tight. And in this case, I don't know. If you're on a phone, I don't think you could see it at all. If you're looking at this in 4K on a big monitor, maybe you could see at the top of my hair, there's some like imperfect little joints, but it's pretty good. And when you leave it on F14, F16, F12, or F11, it's really not the end of the world. And you get the background blur. You get that subject separation. You know, the things you really want from it, you can get from it. And for each image, you can tune it and pick exactly how much you want. And in some cases, it'll look good. Like if you're wearing a nice round hat, it'll look good even down at F8, F4, um, where you'll get that big, beautiful background blur and you'll have that option. And if you know you're only putting it on Instagram, then you can crank up that portrait mode because you know no one is ever gonna look at it with the detail to notice the flaws that it creates, whereas, if you use the shift cam, you'll get a tiny amount of extra background blur that no one will ever see if they're looking at it on a cell phone and you lose the ability to creatively decide later. So I don't know. To me, this is a pretty devastating uh, review of the shift cam as a way to get background blur. It's not. It's a way to lose background blur and get blur all over your eye. I think you get the point. We'll move on. All right. So up next, this is a set of images where instead of like this one where the tripod was stable and I just zoomed in the camera to take the same picture with different levels of zoom. With this one, it's less scientific. I moved the camera and potentially myself because I had to keep getting up to get the same image. And what this gives us is two things. One, it really shows us the different compression that you get from zooming in, right? And that means the way that this first image really shows it, right? That's the wide angle view. And I actually kind of love this image because the sharpness on my eyes is really beautiful and there's just a lot of personality to it. So don't write off wide angle portraits for what it's worth. Normally this is considered a poor choice for people to have them this close to a wide angle lens because it gives this distorted view. And if it's not the perfect angle, it makes their nose look enormous and things like that. And as you zoom in, you get more and more of this compressed look, which is supposed to be more flattering. So here, I'll just go nice and slow through them. You can see which lens is being used on each one. Uh, the lat, lock, lat loss of detail you could see on some of these uh, is not ideal. Okay, so we'll come to a comparison here. They both probably seem good on a cell phone, my right eye on the one with the shift cam is actually really, really beautiful. I love that one eye looks so good, but the one on the left, if we zoom in, I don't know if you could see it. To me, it's completely obvious that the one on the left is totally blurry. The whole left, uh, left side of my face, super blurry, unusable to me. I would much rather have the one on the left or just take more photos and pick the one that's good because the biggest difference here on some level is the way my face looks and that's there's no accounting for my face. All right, so I also zoomed in here for fun on the lens just to show another example of what I'm talking about. 
the color distortion around the six here like is just unmanageable where you have the orange on the bottom and the blue on the top it's 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 like it's just shifted right um if you look carefully here we can see there's a lot more noise on the left but what good is having a lack of noise when the actual image can't be seen look at that where it says telephoto look at that orange fringe so anyway have i proven it have i proven it so this is portraits in a darker scenario. Um, I, it, 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 the camera made a good job of making it look light, but it, I, I assure you it was very, very dim when I actually shot these. And the result is, I would say, um, they're much more similar overall compared to the light portraits. The, because the light was so low and the ISO was so high, my face really loses detail on this one. Um, and when you zoom in, it's the, my eyes don't look sharp. And I, I think it was focused. It's just at a certain point when the ISO is high enough and the noise is thick enough, you stop having sharpness. And so my both of them are sort of equally unsharp, but for different reasons. The one on the right has a better ISO, uh, better fundamental image quality but the lens is smearing it out um but one of my thoughts was that i would when i would use this is when i want to do pictures of people when it's dark in parties and stuff and on some level this does validate it because i can't tell the difference not nearly as much as the other one but i also suspect that it it's that same thing again that that when I took these pictures, the phone was upside down from the other way. And so I happened to be in the sweet spot for the set. I don't know. I can't prove that. But uh, there's definitely still lots of problematic blurring. It's just harder to see because most of the image is blurry. Okay, because of the background being further away from me. All right. So now I want to do a few examples of images that I took with the shift cam lens on the 3x sensor on the zoom on the telephoto lens which of course one last time it only works on the iphone 14 pro and the 15 pro but not the 15 pro max which has the 5x which don't worry you're better off all right so if you have a 3x lens that you can attach this to it does an okay job. And here was an example. I saw this ad for Russian propaganda out on the street in Mexico, and I wanted to take a picture, and I thought, here you go. It's far away. This was as close as I could get on the right with the normal camera, and then putting the shift cam on. Um, when we zoom in, I think we see something really interesting, which is there was twice as much resolution on the right. And, and for me, I can actually see the pixels uh, in the letters here. I don't know if you could see that, but like the pixels are visible. We're at the edge of its actual resolution, but it's still clearer. This text on the right is pretty smushy. Um, and on the car, you could see some really ugly stuff where there's like an orange fringe on the top of the car. And then inside the windows, there's a blue fringe. And that's, there's kind of like a ghostly thing. And it comes up in areas of big contrast where the sun is shining, especially. And we'll look at more examples. But so there's one. Uh, you could see how much further you could see, which is not that much. And you don't really see further because it, it blurs it quite a bit. All right. Next, I was trying to do some wildlife photos. I kind of failed. But here I found a wild cat out here that I was uh, chasing around a little bit. And I thought, what a good subject. So from here... The one on the right probably looks better. It's closer. If we zoom in and compare them, the one on the left, again, I'm zooming into the point where it's it's a bunch of pixels, okay? But on the right, I don't know. You tell me, which one is better? I'm not sure which one I want, but what I know is the one on the left is reliable at least, and the one on the right is unreliable because see where there's like a, a, a bit of light on its back? It's like glowing blue, and that's a lens aberration of some kind. That's not what it looked like. What it looked like in real life was the one on the left. Okay, a couple more of these. Some uh, A tree with what looks like berries, so you could see how we were able to zoom in on it. And then when we pull in really far for detail, we can see that even though it has twice as much resolution at this extreme crop, 
I don't know if you could see it. To me, it's unambiguous. The ones on the right look like they're not in focus, even though they are. The ones on the left look like they're in focus, but they're at pixels at this point. So I don't know. It, the question is, is it worth screwing on the lens? Because you know what happened while I was taking these? And I, here's a bird. So I, I tried to just get some photos. This was a very big bird, which is why I was able to get close enough and take these pictures. While I was screwing on the lens, I missed a lot of images. Birds flew away. The inconvenience is real. And I think I probably could have taken a better picture by chasing this cat around with no lens rather than reaching into my bag, unzipping the little case they give you for the, for the lens and then trying to get it on. And the moment passes and the quality benefit is so small. It's really too bad because I was really hoping this would be one of the uses was wildlife photography. As silly as it sounds, if I know I'm going to be, if I'm chasing around birds already, well, why not? put the lens on and, and, and see, see what I get. But like, look at this stump of wood that happens to have some sun shining on it. It's glowing in a very weird and distracting way. And all the detail is all smushed up and it's just too bad. Okay. So, uh, oh, on this one, I wanted to show some of this other stuff. Like, look at these rings in the background. Why is it? That's, that's barbed wire on a fence why is it doing that you know and like look at the sky up here look at the way these leaves shine with the blue glow the chromatic aberration on this lens is really bad in bright sunlight and that is the worst thing about it even though like i showed you for the portrait it was actually pretty competent because it had subdued lighting but i i, I, I didn't use a lot i didn't take a lot of photos with it on the 1x lens that would test this kind of effect um, another picture of the bird where we could see some pretty outrageous chromatic aberration that isn't there when you use the normal lens. There's stuff like that, but look at this. Look at this purple down at the bottom. Like the default camera lens is never going to give you stuff like this. And if it did, it would actually get corrected because the the phone has software inside that knows if if that if the lens makes a purple line in certain situations the like AI, machine learning, whatever, the, the photo pipeline is gonna say, it's gonna look for it and delete it. It has profiles for the lens. Whereas as soon as you put another lens on top, it's unfortunate, but it doesn't know. So it can't fix it. And so it's in your images and you have to fix it. And none of the software is gonna know about it. When I was using my Fuji, Lightroom has specific configurations for every known lens. So it knows which lens I used, it's in the metadata, and it automatically applies chromatic aberration correction for the type of chromatic aberrations it's gonna find. So it's not, oh, I'm looking for cyan, I'm looking for magenta, I'm looking for whatever. There's no software in the world that's gonna know you had the lens on top, right? Uh, when you're using the shift cam, you are the only one who knows that. Your the metadata just says which zoom level you're using the phone. Okay, so that's my detail review. The three X is surprisingly good, but has its own wonky stuff with how the images render. In addition to the wonky stuff about how to take the photos, right? All of these photos were taken with halide camera app so that was another thing that made me miss images was having to switch to that app and then put on the lens and make sure it was all set up properly whereas i could have just clicked the, the camera button on the front of my phone in the lock screen and been taking pictures if i was using the normal camera what else sucks about this i love you and i'm taking good care of you doing all this work what this represents is the macro the close focusing right how far away something has to be in order to focus on it, right? And there's clearly no macro mode on this lens. If you want macro, you take it off and you use the wide angle lens. But I wanted to see exactly how bad it was, how good it was. And here's the results. Top row, that's the main camera without the lens. Bottom row, the same zooms without with the lens. Um, what I did was I used the Halide app, which has a manual focus mode where you can, it super zooms in and you could see. So I moved the box closer and further until it was perfectly in focus. And then I measured it with the tape measure, which you can see in these images. And I uh, took a picture, right? So 
The measurements let us see how it compares in terms of how far it is. And the images let us see how much you can magnify something with these lenses. So if you want to make something fill the frame, can you? And the answer is, it's a lot harder when you have the lens on. Even though you could see further, we could see that with the main lens, it's the, the main lens is 17 centimeters. Okay, I can't, I'm not going to convert it into Imperial for the uh, United States. -ers. But basically, we can do the comparison 17. And then when we put the lens on, it's 47. So it's more than twice as much. And so what happens is we can only get half as close to the thing while still having it in focus. And so if something is small, you can't make it look big. And this is, of course, the box, which is this big. Um, so it's like head size, I guess. And so if you want to fill the frame with someone's head, you can't, right? And I'll show you this image. Uh, I was trying, when I was taking this set, and I was just saying, my goal was just fill the frame with my head, right? That way, just because it was an easy way to make them all the same and have the same layout. But when I got to 1X with the lens attached, this happened. And I thought, oh my God, it's so uh, blurry. But actually, it's not that the lens lacks detail. It's that it wasn't in focus because it was too close. It's literally impossible to take an in-focus picture of a head the size of mine, which is a pretty big head, <laughs> uh, that fills the frame. I had to move back. And so this image is the same thing. And obviously, it's a lot better. And it has a charm. I had to move back just to get the photo. And I had a bunch of times where this basically happened, where I was able to take a photo without the lens on a certain viewpoint by going to 2x. But when I came here to the lens on, it was blurry and I didn't know why. And the truth, the fact is it couldn't focus. And on the iPhone, I find when you're too close to focus, the phone is really bad at telling you. It like my, my, my mirrorless gives me a red, like it's a green box if it focused and it's a red box if it finished trying and didn't work. On the iPhone, it doesn't tell you that. So if you're taking pictures like this where you're too close because of these statistics that I'm that are boring, um, you're not gonna know. You're, you're only gonna know later when you look carefully on your computer or whatever and see that the person isn't actually in focus. And it really is disruptive because you get used to how close you can get and then all of a sudden it stops working. And the iPhone without a lens on, it really makes you used to trusting it to focus because as soon as you're too close, it not all, it, it switches to the wide angle lens. And at that point, it can go right up to someone's eye and take a picture of their pupil. So you're used to always having shots in focus no matter what. And all of a sudden, you're gonna have a lot of shots if you're getting close to things that don't work. A plate of food, it's not gonna work. 47 centimeters, half a meter, it's a lot. You gotta back up to take a picture. Um, and if you wanna, if you don't have this and you wanna experience it, Take your phone and put it on 2x and then zoom in on things, but try to go a meter away. Like, anyway, it's miserable. It's a lot worse. It's a big downside. And like a lot of the other things that sort of ergonomic things, like having to screw it on, having to use the case, if the quality was good, it would be fine, right? I understand that there's trade offs of attaching a giant, weird extra lens not made by Apple to an iPhone. But on top of everything, this is a bummer and I was sad to see it. Uh, and with the highlight being, if you put the lens on top of the 3X lens, it's 105 centimeters, over a yard for the people in the States that you have to be away from something and you really don't get closer to that if it's small, that's for sure. But usually if you're in that zone where you're just trying to zoom in on things, you're probably far enough away. Like that's fine, don't worry about it. But it is, it is kind of shocking because it's, it's, again, more than double. All right. I think that's enough about that. Another topic of hot debate among people reviewing this lens is the lens flares. So I went outside and did a demo, which I will show you now. Here we are with the 60 millimeter lens attached. We're on 1X. We can also go to 2X. It'll show the lens. And what I want to do was test the... Lens flares. So here we go. Let's see if we can get it. Okay, so the sun is up there just on the corner. We're right at the edge of it. Okay, so here we can see some lens flares that are kind of interesting, blobby, ugly. 
Um, I think this is reasonable. I'm not gonna go and fault a lens for having lens for us like this. Uh, it's very normal. Why are you shooting into the sun, right? Like you can't even look at that with your eyes. But the question is, what's their quality? And the answer is kind of weird. Here, it gets a weird, like, that's just a big lack of contrast. And then look at that really weird blue haunting blobby. So there we go. Like some answers, like kind of stuff that you can get. The real problem though, isn't that it's this one here. Oh, look at that in the bottom right. Oh, that's ugly. I haven't seen, oh, look at this little rainbow one. Anyway, you can get all kinds of stuff. So let's imagine I wanted a shot with that rainbow in it. I'm taking my hand and I'm just covering it a little bit. Just shading it with my hand. So the part thing is not having your hand get into it. But yeah, see, we are mostly safe if I, if I give it a shade with my hand. So depending on your shot, you will be protected. With hand, without hand, you can see that thing is coming in and out. So it's, so it's not impossible to get rid of it, but oh man, it does come up. It does come up. And I had it yesterday, just having my phone near my computer monitor was causing some of them. I'm trying to see if I can get some more um, from different angles. Let's get it over here. There's one. Look at that. Like that is not good for your photo. If I wanted to take a photo of this graffiti here, it's not a good thing. So it's pretty bad, um, but it is survivable. See, I can, I can really delete it by just taking my hand and I could see the shadow on the lens and just casting this, the shadow of my hand over the lens gets rid of it completely and you're all better. So that's not the reason not to buy this lens. <laughs> I think the rest of this video is going to show you why you, I think you probably shouldn't buy this lens, but I just wanted to demonstrate it. Wow. That's a really special one. And again, shadow on the lens fixes it 100%. Uh, you could also put some kind of, unfortunately, there's no lens hood system for this. So hopefully that helped you understand. Like I said, it's not the end of the world. You can fix it. But if you're not using the shift cam lens, you're not going to have that problem, right? If you shoot directly into the sun with the iPhone, yes, you're going to get lens flares in that scenario. But they sneak up on you. And I did have multiple shots throughout this whole process that had the lens flare in them, either the, the red chunky thing in the bottom right or a blue chunky thing in the bottom right like this. It's really just not ideal. And it's another small thing that makes me want to live without this lens. Up next, I want to take a minute to talk about ergonomics in general. And so how does it feel to actually use it? So first of all, the case, I like it. It's okay. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. The buttons are very pleasantly clicky, which is something I care about. The bottom, it could be bigger. Uh, it's a new issue with USB-C cords that there's a lot of cords that aren't have a big thick thing to them and they don't all go into this one. Um, personally, the worst thing about the case is just that I don't want to use this case. I have a white silicone case with a white silicone strap. Um, it's just really different. It's a really different preference I have. I like a lot of grip on my cell phone for holding it. And so just having to use a specific case is kind of a bummer, um, even though I think this is a very good default one and I have no problem with it other than my speculation that maybe it's the the case that's somehow uneven and misaligns the lens and causes that loss of, loss of detail. I don't know. You'd have to work at shift cam and be the person whose boss yelled at them when they realized that quality was there and that all their marketing materials were going to be a lie. But um, yeah, it's good. The, uh, the way the lens attaches is nice. Uh, I, I'm very satisfied with it. I, the moment one, like the moment is another brand of lens that has like a little bayonet thing and it sounds good, but honestly, it, some people complain about this. I was worried it would involve a lot of turning, but, um, I find it's reasonable if I'm, if I know what I'm doing and I'm going for it, I can get it all done in one turn by, by having my hand ready to go. Um, I managed to unscrew it and then hold the phone, hold it, you know, you can hold it in your hand and then take a picture and then screw it back on, which really you don't want to be doing that a lot. But in my testing, I certainly did it a lot and I got pretty good at it. And so I think if, if in terms of that, if I had to use this all the time, I think I'd get adequately competent at it and it wouldn't be a big source of problems. 
Um, one thing I noticed is that the the sort of threads inside the metal of on the lens and inside the case wore down a bit. Like you could see silver inside, but I don't see the problem with that. Honestly, I wish the metal here was silver. I think that would be really cool. Um, but it's fine that it's black and it doesn't matter that it frayed a little bit, but that happened right away and it hasn't caused any problems. <sighs> what else? Well, it came with some other stuff. It came with this lovely polishing cloth uh, with a shift cam logo. I'm going to be using that. That's <laughs> this might be the thing I use the most. Uh, it also came the lens. Okay. The, the case came by itself. The lens came with the cloth. It came with this little, uh, like a, it's a typical little lens brush to clean the lens. And then on the other side, there's a, like a little, it's like a little tiny microfiber, which is good because, uh, in a case like this, the worst thing about a case like this is if the lens gets dirty, you can't clean it. You have to really take it off and it's a pain to take on. I wish it was easier to take on and off because honestly, I'm gonna, if I'm going to use this, I'm going to take it on and off all the time as I go back and forth to my normal lens. But when the phone is in here, you can use this to sort of like clean the lens. And that is a nice thing because I worry about that a lot. Um, yeah, so yeah, nice little gifts uh, on 175 US dollars. If I haven't mentioned that yet, that how much that's how much the lens costs uh, if you're using the default shift cam website. Oh, and of course the case, which is a beautiful little piece of design. It zips up. There is a perfect space for the lens inside. It's all very cute and nice and also not very useful because it 100% is impossible or I don't know, there's someone out there who can do this with one hand. I'm never going to try and learn because once it's open, it has to be all the way open to get the lens out. And once you've got it open, the lens can fall. And in fact, I dropped this in the grass once while trying to take pictures of the birds and I wouldn't want to risk it. So you absolutely need to have two hands to open this and get the lens out. But wait, which hand is holding your phone? <laughs> That's annoying. So I'm not sure exactly. I know uh, Moment has little bags that they give you. And this is much better protection. But I think I'd rather a little pouch because then you could sort of like squeeze the pouch and give birth to the lens uh, with one hand. Or you could uh, hang it on your belt. Like it has a beautiful carabiner here. I'll take the lens out. It has a beautiful carabiner, which is great. So you can hang it on your bag. But you would never, ever want to actually have it hanging and, and rely on that you know like putting it on your belt you'd have to use both hands still um so anyway it's a good case it's high quality you know the the physical design of this it's majestic it's really nice and all of it goes together if only it was sharp uh I, it would be great okay so the other thing i wanted to say about the physical experience of using this lens is that it's heavy it it really adds to the weight. And I don't have the phone in here because I'm filming on my phone, but you could trust me here. It, 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 it's hard to hold. Okay. If you're holding it like this, you're going to be fine. Like you always are with your phone. But if I wanted to shoot one handed, it's, it's basically not very possible at all to get it going. Although you could sort of do it this one way. Um, my thinking was that I would use a grip of some kind. And so this is the shift cam, of course, makes one called the snap grip that does the same thing as this, this is a knockoff one. It says imitation camera feel. I don't know if you could see it, but it's, uh, it's pretty awful. It's super cheap. It doesn't charge your battery. It has a battery, but only for the Bluetooth, but it does the thing that the snap grip does, which is attach to MagSafe and then give you a camera a DSLR style grip so you can hold it like that um, it helps a little bit this one I kind of hate it's really lightweight in a bad way <laughs> I wanted it to be lightweight so that I could carry it and if I don't use it I don't feel too bad but um, with the phone in it doesn't feel secure and it anyway this one is not good there's other ones because you know MagSafe things have the circle and then they can have the line and this one doesn't have the line which means that it can rotate and the snap grip one would be better i think but honestly i'm not totally sold on this whole format because of the way the way your hand anyway um the problem is you're going to be messing around with this stuff so i have this other one which is there's a few in this format um but this was it's called sesen pro it's not a good one it's old and it has the wrong usb on it but it's really ugly <laughs> it sticks up above but actually 
I find it a lot more comfortable. I find it's more like the uh, extended grip I had on my mirrorless where I actually have the thing that screws onto it to add more because it was kind of too subtle. So it, it feels like that. Like I really feel like I could use it one handed, which is good if you're somewhere where you're holding a drink or you're, you're directing people or whatever, right? Like it's useful to be able to shoot with one hand. That's no joke. You need something with a uh, Bluetooth button on it. This one has a Bluetooth button on it. Anyway, you're kind of the, this isn't about the lens, right? You can use it without that, but having a lens, any lens like this kind of pushes you into that territory, especially a big one like this. I think some of the moment ones are like lighter and smaller, um, which looks less impressive, but it, it's relevant. Okay. And final thoughts on ergonomics and the physicality of using it to repeat some things I already mentioned before. Uh, it's annoying. Every time you turn on your phone, you may or may not have to cover the phone, wait for the macro flower icon, and then click it. That's annoying. That's going to make you miss shots. Every time you want to use one of the other lenses. So if you want to get a wide angle shot or you want to get a 3x shot, you're going to have to take this off first and hold it in your hand and find something to do with it. It's not really convenient. And of course, the fact that if you ever want to use it on the 3x lens, even though it works, and if you have a camera, uh, a phone that can handle it, you're going to be annoyed at having to use a third party app. You have to remember that. So overall, a lot of little annoyances, even though uh, if the job of this section was just to review the hardware that came with this, I'm in love. I love it. I, I, it would feel good to buy a lot more of them and develop a whole collection if only the quality was there and if only I could trust the company. Trust the company? Why would I bring that up? Well, Shift Cam is a bit of a problematic company. They have a tendency to mislead their customers and their shipping practices are sketchy as hell as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the summary of this section is if you're going to buy anything from Shiftcam, any Shiftcam products, use Amazon. And if it's not on Amazon, it's okay. Live without it or wait until it comes on Amazon because there's problems. So I'll start with the marketing for this lens, which I think has a lot of issues. Um, the main one being just that it's not true that you don't see further most of the time. You don't get more detail. They're promising to see further. They're promising more detail. They're also showing a lot of images that obviously weren't taken with the camera. And that's just weird and like, I don't know, don't sue me. This is just my opinion, but my opinion is these photos are definitely not taken with this lens on. So this image I actually researched. Okay, so I took this image that they put up where it's at an angle and they use this image over and over again of the phone and the lens and the phone is showing a picture as if you're taking it with the lens. And I reshifted it all so that this image would be appropriate format so I could do a reverse image search. And I just found a ton of places that were using it. Here's an example. So. It's clearly, I don't know, I couldn't find any where it was being sold as a stock photo, but it's clearly being used that way. So my question for you is, what's happening? Did they take a stock photo of a woman and use it, it to make you think it was taken with this lens? Or did all of these different websites somehow find the photo taken with the shift cam lens ultra 60 millimeter and use it? So I think that's pretty unambiguous. Um, further down on the website, they have this section packed with features and magnification, balance proportions. And I looked at these photos and I said, there's no way these photos were taken with this lens. Like, why are you lying to me? Look at that dog. And then I got like, you scroll to the side and I saw this photos and I said, wait, I swear I've seen this one with the kid and the blur before uh, in like some in my history of reading blog articles and stuff. Uh, and it's just impossible, the amount of blur on this. And I did a reverse image search and I found it on a blog. This is actually a blog article about Aperture and this is their example of too much background blur. It's an 85 millimeter lens on surely a full frame camera at f1.6, right? An extreme scenario where everything will always be blurry. 
so that the boy could be so far away and still in focus while the background is so blurry. So I don't know. It's just shameless. It, it doesn't make any sense. And then this one of the boy, for fun, I looked it up too. And look, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least seven websites are using this image as a stock photo. What's the likelihood that it was taken with the lens? Obviously not. So it's just a really strange choice um, on the part of shift cam not to just find photos that were taken with their with their actual lens. I don't know. Like, I would rather it be realistic. They actually used to have even more fake photos that weren't taken, but they changed it, which is good, and added some photos from YouTubers that they paid, right? And they sent these lenses to a lot of YouTubers for free. So they gave them like $15, $1,500 USD or 2000 I'm not sure exactly how much it was worth, but they sent it to them for free and said, hey, do a review. And then guess what? They gave positive reviews. But that is where they get these photos. So these are the names of different people who they sent the lenses to for free and then they got reviews. Um, and so these are real photos taken with it and they are not impressive. I, I don't know about you, but this photo as an example of being able to see far and get a lot of detail, this is horrible. This is exactly what I would expect from using the lens and, and it doesn't make me want to buy it at all. The star one is interesting, although it's, again, it's not, it doesn't actually have good colors or anything. It's just a kind of interesting photo, although not even. It's a bit of a lazy photo because the YouTuber was in a rush to do a review. My photos in this review aren't good. Shift cam, don't use them to promote the product, please, because they're bad photos. Uh, this one, JCK RBG, I watched a couple of his videos and this photo was kind of okay, but again, what a good example of the lens. Look at the loss of detail all around the cat. That's not background blur. That's just blur. That's just loss of detail. Like this is so unimpressive. Anyway, it's amazing, but this was the best they could do. And that's why from the beginning they had lies. I think these ones might be real, but anyway, these ones down here, I don't know what to say other than this is very misleading. The idea that people would assume these photos weren't taken with the lens is like really hard to believe. So um, anyway, uh, while we're on the website, I'll just point out that they very interestingly have um, these reviews. You can read reviews on their own website that people write, and a lot of them are very negative. Um, not a lot of them have good examples of photos, even though you can upload photos, and a lot of them are about people who are extremely dissatisfied. So <laughs> if you're gonna buy one of these, go read them. It's confusing for what it's worth if you're trying to make sense of this. It's confusing because the different products are all mixed together. You come to the bottom of the page about this 60 millimeter lens and all the reviews are for all the different lenses and it doesn't always say which one they're reviewing. So the, uh, the, the ones that are really popular are the long range macro. People like that one. They like the wide angle one. It's not as bad. I think the 60 millimeter is probably the biggest loser in the whole bunch actually. And the reviews for it were really good in the initial batch of reviews when they were doing their Kickstarter, they sent it out to a bunch of YouTubers and a lot of them were like, this is the sharpest telephoto lens I've ever used. It's sharper than Moment, it's sharper than uh, Sandmark. But then a lot of the same people got new review copies of the final product because what they had before was some kind of prototype or I don't know exactly what happened. But when they tried it on their 15 Pros and did the same review again, all of a sudden they were like, yeah, that 60 millimeter is nothing special. And maybe, and they had a couple examples, but I feel like they were burying it because they didn't want to show how bad it was. That's my little suspicion. Can't prove it. All I can prove is that the lens is blurry and you saw all the examples already. So one of the things people complain about a lot in these reviews, and I've also seen them complaining about it in the comments of other YouTube videos about these lenses, is just not getting their product, specifically the people who signed up for the Kickstarter for the launch of this whole Lens Ultra series. Some of them bought the full set. They spent $1,500 on all of this lenses and they just didn't get them. Months pass, months pass, months pass. Where's my lenses? Some of them are still out there. If you go to their Instagram of ShiftCam, you could still see people complaining, saying, hey, who do I have to get in touch with to get my lenses? And it's like, what? Like they might have a whole new phone already and they still haven't gotten their lenses. And that's weird. Um, my lens sort of came at a reasonable pace 
um, it was slowed down because the they had not yet shipped any of the iPhone 15. I got my iPhone 15 as soon as possible after it came out. And so the, it takes them a minute to get the case ready and launch it. So I was waiting for that, but it came relatively quickly aside from a terrible, I had a whole situation where my address was wrong. And then they messaged me and said, you, we tell us that you, your address is wrong. Tell us a new address. And I was like, I didn't get the message from their ticketing system. And then I got a message from their ticketing system saying, you never replied, so we're closing this ticket, which I don't know what would have happened. I would have just never gotten my lenses. But I replied to them and tried to help them change my address. But they never replied to me. Uh, I waited like a week and I was like, hello, are you there? Like, are you helping me change my address? And they're like, oh, sorry. And then they tried to fix it. But uh, they never, they really were terrible at getting back to me. It was incredible. And in the end, I wrote them and I said, you know what? Cancel my order. I don't even want this thing anymore. Uh, And they were like, oh, we already shipped it. Like that was how they told me that they had worked out the address thing and then shipped it. And then I wrote them back right away and said, oh, what address did you ship it to? Because I had given them different versions of my address and I wanted to know which one they were trying. And they never wrote back. They never wrote back at all. Also, uh, I bought it during Black Friday and there was like a 20% off and it was supposed to be a little tripod, like a little crappy, their crappiest, most poorly reviewed tripod. Uh, was supposed to come free in the package because I had spent over $200 or something like that. And it never came. When I got it, there was no tripod there. And I wrote them and told them about that and they never <laughs> replied to me. So I, I don't know. I shouldn't even have this product because I tried to cancel it, but they didn't listen to me. Like they're very bad that this experience of going on their website and buying things is just awful. And I'll throw something else in, which it didn't, I didn't see it in the purchasing system. I only learned about it because of a comment on their Instagram, which was, If you buy it using a code, which is like a 10% off, a 20% off, you can get them on the other YouTube reviewers have these codes that they give you. I don't have a code. Don't buy it. (laughs) Um, But if you use one of those codes, you can never return the product. All sales are final if you use the code. And that's toxic. That's terrible. I'm like, this is not appropriate. And so many people learn about this when they try and return their products. And I'm like, I don't think it's a coincidence. I don't think I'm the only one who made it through that. I think you have to like click terms, terms of service and then read everything. So boy, oh boy, shift cam. I don't like supporting companies that are misleading. Uh, there was also the thing where it says on the box that it is a two times teleconverter the 60 millimeter, and it's not, it's a 1.75. And there's a lot of companies that make 1.7s and not a lot of companies that make two times. And so it's like a marketing advantage. Like I was comparing it to the beast cam lens and it was only 1.7. I said, well, two is more than 1.7 and it's just not, it's 1.75, no difference at all. The other thing that comes to mind that's a bit misleading was their close focusing they claimed it was 30 to 40 centimeters close focusing distance. And I measured it at 47 centimeters and 105 centimeters. It's not the end of the world. Although Apple claimed 20 centimeters and 60 centimeters. And it turned out to be 17 and 41. While shift cam claimed 30 to 40. And I got 47 to 105. It may be that that 30 to 40 was for a different camera, like a different phone. But either way, you know, you just can't trust what they're saying. None of their marketing material is true. They're not giving you a realistic impression of what it can do. And the fact that they claim that it works perfectly with the iPhone 15, I think just isn't true in my experience. There's big problems with the iPhone 15 Pro anyway. I think this has been long enough. Let's start wrapping it up here with my final review. I don't recommend this lens. I can't think of times when I would use it rather than nothing. And to me, that's the definition of a bad purchase. I shouldn't have spent money on it. I hope this video is entertaining to you so that I didn't waste my money. I honestly think part of my problem here is that all lenses like this are inherently problematic and imperfect. They are going to degrade quality to some degree And they're going to be extremely finicky in terms of phones as phones change. There's a whole thing with the moment lenses, which worked for several phones in a row. And then as the iPhone 
cameras got bigger and the lenses got bigger, the add-on lens stopped working. It got really blurry in the corners or they get dark in the corners. And it's it's just an inherent part of it. And I happened to get bitten by buying a lens just as a new phone was coming out. And I didn't wait for the reviews to come out with my phone. I assumed that because every everything about it said that it's the same camera in the 14 and the 15, that the reviews about the 14 would also apply to the 15, but it wasn't true. So my advice about this lens, about any lens like this is don't buy it unless you can find a review of your exact phone and your exact lens. And so this review isn't about the iPhone 15. Maybe it, it does have a different lens from the 15 Pro, even though they're very similar. It's, it's more different from the 14, so who knows, right? Don't rush. Definitely don't rush because you don't know how it's going to be on each new phone. And another aspect of this is don't buy a lens like this imagining you'll use it with multiple phones. Because if I had bought this for my iPhone 14 Pro, it would already stop being valuable, assuming it's good on the 14 Pro. And I just, I don't know if these final production lenses are good or if it was the prototypes or if people were delusional. I don't know why people thought it was good on the 14 Pro. What I know is I'm never gonna buy a lens like this planning to have its value accrue over multiple phones the way it absolutely is true. I bought this lens for a different Fuji camera and then the new one came out and it worked perfectly. There was no problem. And, and these things hold their value really well because of that, right? I could probably still sell this lens uh, for a good amount, even though it's get, getting on 10 years old. When it comes to these phone lenses, make the financial decision based on the phone you're going to have based on the exact plans you have of how to use it in the short term. And if it does work with a future phone, that's great. But uh, don't forget, you're going to need to buy a case, you know, if for each new phone. And personally, like, even if I keep this, even if I use it sometimes for certain projects, I'm very confident I'm not going to spend another $40 on another case to use this on a future phone, even assuming it could work. It just won't be worth it to make that small investment. And so there you go. Buy it for the phone you have and buy it after seeing a delicate review like this one that really goes into it. Part of the problem was, of course, all these reviews I watched reviewed this lens, but they also reviewed like six other lenses. So they only had a few minutes per lens and they didn't go into the kind of detail I went into here. Okay, so you've heard me. You're not going to buy this lens for a, a future phone, right? And you're not going to buy it for your iPhone 15 Pro because you, you saw you saw what happens. What about older phones? It's hard for me to say about any previous phone. What I will say is, if you've got an iPhone 11, 12, 13, the ones without the big, or the 14 non-pro, the ones that don't have the 48 megapixel sensor that can do the 1.5 and the 2X, sort of without losing quality while still having the 12 megapixels, there is a bigger value because when we look at the chart of the different sizes, we see, you know, if you only have an iPhone 13 non-pro, then the only image you can really get is that first one. And so the ability to get some of these lens ultra ones, it's a big improvement in zoom. And if you have something like the 13 or the 11, you know, and it does have a 2X lens like my 11 had, it's really low quality. And so maybe the the shift cam is going to compete with that low quality 2X a lot better than on the 15 Pro, right? We are spoiled with riches with these latest 14 Pro and 15 Pro where you have the 48, you have the 3X, you have the ones in the middle, and it just makes the extra sort of versatility of focal length so much less valuable and then we become more critical of the detail and the in the fuzzy eyes and all that stuff so if you've got an older phone maybe it is worth it but then again aren't you going to upgrade it when are you going to upgrade that iphone 12 or 13 and knowing that you probably won't want to use it with the phones iphone 15 and newer Maybe it's not a good investment again, you know, like take that money and put it towards upgrading your phone faster. My iPhone 15 is amazing. The camera difference from my iPhone 11 is shocking. So 
I don't know who this is for, you know, but if you have an old camera, you're not planning to upgrade and you really want that extra versatility, maybe it does make more sense than it does for me personally. Another thing I wanted to point out in this conclusion is that there's other things you could just spend your money on. Like if you're just dead set on spending money like me uh, on improving your mobile photography, on having more options with your mobile phone, have you considered investing in lighting? You know, buy one of those pocket lights. You can get them for like $40. Maybe buy a bigger light, buy an LED light or a chip on board light, uh, something that you can bring with you and add light into a scene because like part of the reason I wanted this was to the extra megapixels, the bigger sensor, being able to use the bigger sensor while zooming in means I can shoot in darker scenarios. But bringing light also lets you shoot in darker scenarios and you'll get more detail out of it. Another thing you could invest in is stabilization. So depending, so that could be just a tripod, like get a tripod. It'll give you options to shoot. It'll make you creative. You know, if you're taking videos, for sure, you want to have a tripod so you can have stability. Uh, the other option is the um, gimbal. You know, you get a gimbal and you can put your phone on it and, and keep super smooth motion, right? All those things are going to help you get higher image quality that are probably going to work better than trying to get the image quality by using this lens. I, obviously, another one, just edit your photos, like really learn how to edit, make the most of it. The, the tools in the phone, the tools in Apple Photos on your computer are excellent these days. Learning to use that portrait mode is my biggest thing because so much of what you might want from this to create the appearance of a bigger sensor, of a bigger lens, can be had with the portrait mode. Like I said earlier, just tune it. Tune it carefully. Give it that little bit of extra sauce and you'll see that it looks great on a phone. The imperfections it causes are no big deal. And you can always turn it off if it's not good, unlike the problems caused by this lens, which you can't turn off if it doesn't turn out well. I'm planning to just focus on being judicious and creative in my use of the portrait mode as a way to avoid having any FOMO from not using this lens. And then last one on this list, just use all the lenses in the phone. Don't forget, like, I bet there's a lot of users who never take that one and make it 1.5, which says 35 and two, and use the two, right? Use the one, use the 1.5 by clicking on the one, use the two and use the three. Use them all, pal, you know? Don't waste what you have just because you feel like there's something else that could be better. For people who are just getting into this, having all these different lenses, I think it's a real mind shift. And it really is the thing that makes this lens so pointless is that we are spoiled with this top row and that that's really all we need. All right. We're really close to the end here. I just wanted to quickly go over some other equivalent products that I was interested, that I looked into and I decided not to buy. So the one that I think is most compelling is this Beast Grip uh lens, which is a 1.7 teleconversion lens. So it's basically promising the same thing, but it's bigger and it's heavier. And I think it, uh, in the reviews I've seen, it did a better job with the iPhone 15 Pro. Uh, the problem with this is one, it's super expensive. It's $200 US and it requires these enormous cases. There's no other way to mount it than with these big giant cases. Each of these cases weighs 300 grams. Uh, the Lens Ultra weighs about 109 grams. This thing weighs 175 grams just for the lens. And then you have to use these enormous cases, either this one that like holds it in place and can work with any phone or a special case. And these cases cost over $200 themselves and they add 300 grams. And for me, that was just a deal breaker. I want my kit to be light and this one doesn't look light. It's really for professional filmmakers. The whole point is all these holes and stuff so that you can have a whole camera rig. Uh, for someone just doing photography at parties, it's like super duper overkill and like it's never gonna go in your pocket. So for me, that was a dead end. But if that ergonomics of that matches what you're looking for, it seems to me I sort of wish I had bought this one instead because at least it might have been useful, whereas I know the one that I bought isn't useful. The most popular is the Moment lenses. They've been around for years and they have the T-Series one, which they claim works well with the newer lenses. I haven't watched a lot of, I haven't watched a review this detailed as mine um, for this lens on the iPhone 15 Pro. 
but I think it's sort of well known that there's flaws. It's not perfect. There's softness in the corners and things on this lens, but I have a feeling it would still be better than the way the Lens Ultra is just completely destroyed in terms of quality. Um, if I was going to buy one, I might buy this one. Finally, the other one that people seem to enjoy is the Sandmark. Um, so yeah, the moment was 150. This one is 129. So this is the cheapest of them. And honestly, I don't know. I, I feel like the quality is probably about the same. The lens itself is kind of ugly. I don't know. I'm very uh, superficial about these things. The nice thing about both the moment and the Sandmark ones is that they have these kind of universal things. So you don't have only one case. They each sell cases, but you can also get some from the company Small Rig. They make a case that works with both of these types of lenses. This one, which is like a, I think they call it 17 millimeter thread. And then this one, which has a special moment brand thread. But um, the shift cam ones are completely custom and I haven't seen any cases from third parties that use it, which is too bad. So I would definitely, I think if I was gonna buy one, I would get the Sandmark, but you know what? I'm not in the market. I, I'm, I'm convinced by this experience that my phone can do everything I need. I just wanted to like show you the Sandmark, the moment and the B-script because I think it's worth promoting the companies that aren't abjectly lying and getting famous for never delivering their products to people. Okay. For my closing thought, I want to look at this image. This was actually the first image I took with the lens. It's my partner. I love her. And I just love this photo. I love the look in her eyes. I love the energy. I love how I'm taking the photo with the lens and she's holding the box. I love it all. And so there you go. It's funny. What an auspicious start to a terrible relationship I have with this lens. And the thing about it is the lens is capable of taking good images. If you have a good thing in front of you and you get a good angle and the light is good, you're going to have a nice picture, especially if one of the eyes is in focus. And this is another one of these images where her right eye is in focus and her left eye is blurry because of the nature of the lens. But it doesn't matter because it's a great photo. But I right away said, wait, wait, let's do a test. And I took two more photos that I specifically made the same one with the lens and one without, and you get this. And the thing I want to say about this, like without knowing which of these has the lens and which doesn't, it doesn't matter <laughs> more than anything. The problem with this lens is it doesn't do anything that matters if you have a phone that can zoom to 2x. One of these is missing a bunch of detail. One of these has her glasses are a little bit worse. The thing that makes the photo on the right better is just the slight angle of her head that makes the reflection in her glasses a little bit better. And that's my reminder that like what matters is what's in front of the camera. It's how you relate to it. It's taking enough pictures that you have choices when you're editing. If this lens was worth all the hassles it came with, you would be able to tell which was which even on a phone. And so... When I look at these, all I can think is I should focus on what's in front of the camera and what's going on in my head and not on the camera itself in this context because this lens just isn't worth it. I'm not going to be pulling it out very often. I suspect a lot of people who buy it are going to take some test shots like this. Maybe they'll get a great one that they love like this one. And then they're going to put it on their desk. And then a little while later, they're going to clean their desk and they're going to put it in a drawer. And then that's where it's going to live. And my suggestion to you is be careful. <laughs> Don't be one of those people who puts this lens in a drawer. I'm going to invest in lighting instead and in practicing and taking pictures and going out and doing those things rather than fussing over this lens and the case and all the things. <sighs> I'm so sorry for subjecting you <laughs> to so much of this review. I did not think it would be this long when I started. I am Jer. I love you. Bye-bye.